I know. All right, almost ready. Here we go. It's, it's countdown time. Oh, wrong commercial. <laughs> Do you ever see that commercial? It's time to start. Anyway, welcome everybody. Welcome to those watching online. Welcome to those who showed up on the 24th of December in a Sunday morning service. That's really, really cool. I had more people than I thought. So this is, this is a delight. And the coffee is extra yummy. Don't know why, it just is. And uh, if you're watching online, make sure you do a quick hello and tell us where you're watching from. Because uh, I see names, but I don't know where everyone's from. Uh, that would really help. And then I'll do a shout out a little bit later. So let's get into some of our announcements. As you know, I have a very dry sense of humor or dad joke humor, and it's just the way it is. So, oh, this is no joke. This is like a hundred days away or so for Blue Jay season to start. Isn't that a great thing to think about at Christmas Eve? I think it's delightful. Anyway, um, they call them heated seats because rear defroster was already taken. <laughs> She's thinking, she's thinking, there we go. <laughs> Me, after verifying four translations and the original Greek that Jesus really did say, love your enemies. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> Men wrapping gifts, they're terrible at it, but give them something to barbecue. Boy, they can wrap it perfectly. And seriously, what are they celebrating? Think about this. Do you get this? The Flintstones. Jesus wasn't born yet. Okay. Yeah, see? Oh, Elizabeth, you're just making my day. Um, I love this one. This is very funny. Sorry, no room at the end. There's a convention in town. The convention is National Association of Prophets. This year's theme, Make Way for the Messiah. <laughs> Lastly, peaceful manger scene or a two T-Rex fighting over a table saw. <laughs> See the eyes? Table saw. <laughs> Sorry, perspective. Elizabeth, you like that one. <laughs> Okay, very good. Birthdays, Kathy. Uh, happy birthday on the 26th. All these poor people have their birthdays melted into Christmas. How many times are you told this is for your birthday and Christmas? I saw a cartoon of the wise men bringing it to Jesus. This is for your birthday and Christmas. Anyway, Sharon, happy birthday on the 28th. Brent doing sound, happy birthday on the 28th. No anniversaries that we are aware of, because I think Julie and Mike are the closest uh, wedding to, to uh, Christmas. Um, pray for Rainy. Do you remember Rainy? He chimes in all the time from Alabama. He's got a um, recovery ministry. Uh, he was part of the Forgiveness Conference, uh, one of the contributors. His wife, Shirley, um, broke her ankle and then discovered, as a result of that, she has cancer. And so pray for them. Um, he's connected to us and has been for a long time. So we're going to be praying for Shirley. Um, next Sunday... Oh, by the way, no service tonight, obviously. Um, no service in the morning next Sunday, except online. So no in person, but we're going to be just meeting online. And like we used to do in COVID, we're going to have our after, ch after church Zoom call. So I sent the link out. What we used to do as soon as the live stream ended, we all joined a Zoom call, say hello to everybody, do the Hollywood Squares thing, and it was really fun. Um, we don't do it all the time. We haven't done it for a long time. So this would be a nice thing to do. Look at all these Christmas sweaters. I'm just noticing them. Wow. Okay, so that'll be happening. Um, looking forward to that. I'll send the link out again in this week's coming email. Um, I'm going to ask you all to do something really neat and helpful. If you can go on to Google and look up Hope Fellowship, not the website, just in Google in the search, um, and then click on reviews and add a review. Uh, we had someone leave a dumb review. And it's like, really? And if there's only five reviews, then the rating goes way down. So I, um, I reported two of them because they were, it's called conflict of interest. They just have nothing to do with us. So it was not an honest review. So if everybody puts a review in there, it just kind of moves it up and it just helps a lot. So if you could do that, that'd be great. 
If you don't know what I'm talking about, move on. Annual meeting, January 28th, and we're going to have a church luncheon, so all the actual members, especially the new ones that just came in, we're having a membership meeting to go over the reports and the budget and approve all that stuff, um, and then we need the reports from all the ministry leaders. <sighs> I know. All right. Um, I sent a link in the weekly email. Um, uh, for the recording of the Christmas service. Last Sunday night was really a nice, nice service. Um, so if you didn't get to participate in that, uh, you can watch the video. It's not as good as being here in person, but it was still a delight. So thank you for all those that put time and heart into it, and all the cleanup, setup, musicians, everyone involved. That was really, really nice. Supporting what you value. Um, sent a, a financial update in the weekly email, and there's two things that were really important. Are we're behind in budget, and that's usually normal, but the actual is so low that it's like, oh my goodness, we still have today and next Sunday in this calendar year. Um, but to see that kind of catch up is kind of a miracle. I know we sold off a bunch of our chairs. Uh, they did sell, so that adds to it, but still, to see that kind of a more reasonable year end it's been, it's been really nice, really nice. All right. All right, let's say hello to those online. And before I do, um, I'm going to read off who's here in person. A whole bunch. So we got me, Lori, and Simon's here. Brent and Chris are here. Mary and Joseph Christmas. The Shaws. Get it? Mar Mary and Joseph Christmas? We know who they came Okay, yes. I'm ringing. You can hear the ringing in the room. Okay. Maggie's here making her awesome coffee. Um, Marv Ellis. A oh, marvelous. Oh, that was good. Lorinda is here. Drew, Aaron, and Lauren. Elizabeth is here. And Norma's here. Marty, Tim, and Rowan are here. Yay! Hi, Rowan. So cool to see them. Um, Janet's here. Dan and Ellen are here. Russ is here. Julie and the kids are here. And let's say hello to those watching online. Uh, first one commenting this morning is Debbie and Jerry in New Hamburg. Good morning. Uh, Nancy in Kitchener. Brent from the sound booth. Um, Sandy Prince in the UK. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Jody from Kansas. Merry Christmas from her. Uh, Becky and Wayne watching in Waterloo. Bev watching in Chatham. Merry Christmas. Uh, and then we have Nagal. I forget who this is. Uh, Merry Christmas from Mark, Joy, and Dorothy, Mark's mom. And then um, from Credition, Ontario. Where's that? Huh. Okay. I'll have to look that up. Um, and then Steve and Jen Haymaker, good morning. Uh, Victoria Wood from Kitchener, praying for you, Victoria. She's dealing with some lung issues and pneumonia stuff, so keep praying for her. The, all those are in the weekly email. Uh, Howard and Kathy from Sorrento, British Columbia. Amanda from Hank, Amanda, and the kids. They're usually in the back row. Um, at least her kids are. I saved those seats for them. Sandy Prince. Oh, her birthday's the 27th. Okay, Sandy, happy birthday on the 27th. That's cool. So we'll have to put her name on the list. Sandy, can you send me an email? And just that way you can put it on my list. I'd love to include you because we have our online family too. And it's really, really cool. Maybe next week we get to meet you on the Zoom call. That'd be really cool. Um, Nancy Jenks in Waterloo, good morning. Amanda and Michael uh, Joseph from Kitchener. And Scott and Kathy in Holland Landing. And Helen Thiessen in Saskatchewan, I believe. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Lots of folks watching. And it's going to be my delight to invite Simon and Lori to come on up and lead us in a couple songs. So would you guys please come? This is... Uh, it's nice to have Simon home. Yeah. <laughs> no, I won't, I won't give you any extra attention, you know. <laughs> so, very good. All right, here we go. Alex and Karen in Ottawa. Yes, thank you for quickly writing that. Alex and Karen in Ottawa, Merry Christmas to you. Hey, everybody. Hey, it's good to be here. It's good to be back. Thanks, for everyone, for coming on Christmas Eve. Um, I know my mom is really happy that I'm doing music with her today. She dragged me up here. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm just ready. We're, good. We're prepared. Just give me one. We're, yeah, just start playing. Just start playing. We're good. I invite everyone to stand and sing with us today. Oh. 
Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. stars are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh hear the angel voices oh night divine Christ was born, oh, night divine, oh, night, oh, night divine. Truly he taught us to love one another, his law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise, we let all within us Praise His holy name, Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise His name forever. Noel, Noel, oh, night, oh, night divine, Noel. You guys can take a seat. We're going to do one more song. This song is from one of my favorite Christmas movies. Um, and today is the only day of the year that you can actually sing this song. So, really excited. Yeah, that's Kermit. There's magic in the air this evening, magic in the air. The world is at her best, you know, when people love and care. The promise of excitement 
is one the night will keep. After all, there's only one more sleep till Christmas. The world has got a smile today. The world has got a glow. There's no such thing as strangers when a stranger says hello. And everyone is family. We're having so much fun. After all, there's only one more sleep till Christmas. Tis the season to be jolly and joyous. With a burst of pleasure, we feel it arrive. It's the season when the saints can employ us to spread the news about peace and to keep it alive. There's something in the winds today that's good for everyone. Yes, faith is in our hearts today. We're shining like the sun. And everyone can feel it. The feeling's running deep. After all, there's only one more sleep till Christmas. After all, there's only one more sleep till Christmas Day. Yay! That was awesome. Hi ho, Kermit the Frog in Sesame Street. Where is it on the Muppets? I'm sorry. I've never preached a sermon in Kermit the Frog before. This could be very exciting. <laughs> I don't get out much. <laughs> I did try Donald Duck once. Yes, that was fun. Nobody understood a word I said. But anyway, Russ, would you be our candlelighter? Just light them all, because we don't have another chance for all of them. But today's the fourth advent, the advent of peace. And it reminds us of this. God, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those he favors, or goodwill towards men. Do you know what? It's you and I that are favored as well. He came to Mary, the angel came to Mary and said, you are highly favored. <laughs> well, you and I are also favored. And I thought that was really good. Wow, Russ, you're really good at this. Of course, yeah. There we go. We put brand new candles on the uh, Christmas evening service. This kind of didn't go well. Cheap candles. So hopefully this set will work a little bit better. Love it. All right, kids, those who want to go, Julie is going to have a special class with you guys if you want. Is that still on, Julie? Yeah. Good, because I just said so. <laughs> That'd be really awkward. All right. Okay. Let's begin. Oh, yeah, Rod says hello, and uh, he says, great work, Simon, on hitting those notes. And then Suzanne Cormier says, good morning, Hope Fellowship. So we got a couple more hellos in before we got started. So that's awesome. By faith and sight. This is important because the wise men had faith and then saw and responded. And you can see that happening all through the Christmas store. But before we do, there was a couple things that made me stop, pause, and ponder this week. And uh, some of them are doozies. They just kind of hit my soul really well. I love this one. If you are restless... If you are not able to sit peacefully and with stability, it's because you are not established in the now. Restlessness is the disease of our times. And the more we try to fill it with the consumption of things, the more the emptiness grows and the more restless we become. We should remind each other that the now is the only thing that is solid and real. I know it's from a different philosophy, but there's a lesson in there that I thought was really, really good. The most important spiritual growth doesn't happen when you're meditating or on a yoga mat. It happens in the midst of conflict when you're frustrated, angry, or scared, and you're doing the same old thing, and then suddenly realize that you have a choice to do it differently. That's when the maturity shows up. I thought, ooh, that's good. <laughs> I like this one too from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Who will celebrate Christmas correctly? 
whom whoever finally lays down all power, all honor, all reputation, all vanity, all arrogance, all individualism beside the manger. This is about true surrender. I thought that was really good. He was a, a German theologian. I love this part too. This is from one of the songs. Oh, Holy Night has a verse that was intentionally left out in the 1800s and sometimes today. It goes like this. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Change shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Not a popular verse and not in every version of the song. I thought, this is important. I, I remember this one, but it's, it's, this is a doozy. It's hard to hear God's voice when you've already decided what you want him to say. <laughs> Isn't that true? Lord, answer my prayer. I already did. <laughs> Lastly, from Henry Nouwen, the great spiritual task facing me is to so fully trust that I belong to God, that I can be free in the world, free to speak even when my words are not received, free to act when my actions are criticized, ridiculed, or considered useless, free also to receive love from people and to be grateful for all the signs of God's presence in the world. I'm convinced that I will truly be able to love the world when I fully believe that I am loved far beyond its boundaries. This brings us back to we love because he first loved us. Really important to remember that. It's going to be hard to love other people. In fact, there's some people you can't even stand, right? We, we have those people in our minds. But the more the love of Christ permeates our hearts and minds, it will flow into us loving others more authentically. I thought that was really good. All right, let's have this Advent meditation clip, please. A humble and faithful servant of the Lord, searching a lifetime for the consolation of Israel, here's a message from the Lord. You will not die until you see the Messiah. The whole world, whether they knew it or not, waited, watched, wondered with great anticipation for divine deliverance. And then one still and starry night, we peer into the face of perfect peace. We who once waited in darkness now see the light of salvation. We who stirred in restless turmoil welcome the newborn King. He is the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. He is the long awaited promise, the tidings of comfort the goodwill toward man, the gift from God to his people, washing away darkness with light, offering forgiveness of sin with a cleansing sacrifice that blots out the permanent stain on the soul of all humankind and sets it into an eternal peace for all who call on the name of the Lord. The consolation of Israel has begun in the quiet town of Bethlehem. It is not the end of the story. It is only the beginning. Prophecy. If somebody prophesies or predicts something, it's all, well, I guess using a weatherman's a really bad example. <laughs> but they try to predict and prophesy what's going to happen. However, in today's scientific uh, adventures, it's not so much a prophecy, it's reading, this, reading the diagrams and such. So they're not coming up with a, an idea. They're seeing patterns. But we have a 400-year journey of when Israel was waiting to hear from God. 400 years of silence. Can I have the clicker, pretty please? Mm -mm. There we go. We have this old saying from Isaiah 9, 6. It says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is speaking ahead. This is hundreds of years before Jesus is born. This is speaking to what was going to come. 
powerful. We, there's, in fact, there's so many prophecies, you, your jaw would kind of hit the floor. Some are kind of pushing it, and, okay, that, but that's how they saw the prophecy. This is how the Hebrew people saw the prophecies. So we can have our subjective ideas and go, that's not really a prophecy. That's nice. You can say that, and we have the freedom to. However, when the Israelite and, and the Hebrew nation saw these texts as something pointing forward, something caught their attention. So there's a reason for that that we're unaware of, so we have to respect that too. I love this from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Where else is this in the New Testament? Anybody remember? Vaguely? Right when Jesus was asked to read in the temple. He, wrote, he chose this, that. Today it happens. And he closed the book. It's pretty powerful. But let's go back. Bethlehem was no mistake. And by the way, remember where Mary and Joseph were? They weren't in Bethlehem at the time of getting pregnant and all that stuff. This is back in Nazareth. So how are they going to get to Bethlehem? Well, guess what? A census happened, and they were forced to go to Bethlehem. They had relatives there, but it says in Micah, hundreds of years before the birth, the Lord says, Bethlehem, you will not be an important town. Oh, so you might not be an important town in the nation of Judah, but out of you will come a ruler over Israel for me. His family line goes back to the early years of your nation. It goes all the way back to days of long ago. This little town. Hmm. And then what about the star? I, I actually didn't realize there was a prophecy of a star potentially. And here it is from Numbers 24, and this is, this is how they saw it. Um, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, and a scepter shall rise from Israel, and shall crush through the forehead of Moab, oops, and tear down the sons of Sheth. This, this is, it's kind of weird, but there is an insinuation for the star that the wise men ended up following. I think there's a couple others too, but this was this is the most one of the blunt ones that the Hebrew um, understanding sees as one of the pointers to that star. Gifts. I didn't know there was a prophecy of gifts that were supposed to come. May the king of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. Okay. Making connection. These are things written hundreds of years before Christ. And this one could even have been written by David. How about the timing? This one is exciting. This one I did not see. And if I did, it was a long time ago and I forgot. But this is, this is very, very cool. The timing of Christ's birth uh, and life would come before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Here we go. Now listen and understand. You're going to see where, where this comes from in the Old Testament in just a moment. Listen and understand. Listen and understand. I don't understand this next part. <laughs> seven sets of 70 plus 62 sets of seven will pass. <laughs> Do you get that? I don't. But anyway, from, time, from the time the command is given. To rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and temple. The end will come with a flood and war. And its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. Daniel 9. Hmm. Well, it happened. And the utter destruction of Jerusalem happened 40 years after Christ. 
He warned them. Even, even when there was in Matthew he was saying, hey, if you see the armies coming, flee to the mountains. Don't, don't go get your coat in, from your house. Get to the mountains. Run now as soon as you see them coming. Because the natural default would be run into the city walls where you're protected. And all you got to do is do a little bit of history search and you're going to discover it was awful for Jerusalem. And so many Jews died and the temple was utterly destroyed. But most Christians fled to the mountains because they heard they were ready. Hmm. Wise men. I always have this fun moment of highlighting that there, you think there's three, but there weren't. Okay, just in case, we three kings of Orient are. See, music really screws up theology. It just does. And if you see some of our hymns, they're terrible, some of the lines. But there's a really good hymn or another verse right after the really bad one. How do you, that's so hard. But three wise men, no. There's nothing in the scriptures that express anything about three wise men. One, it's not logical because if they came with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which is the only thing of three that we see there, and they may have actually brought other stuff. We just don't know about it. But if you're carrying that kind of serious cash, um, you're going to need some people around you. And they likely had like 50 to 100 people, a caravan. Very likely because you need that security in the way <laughs> the world was because there were so many bandits and they had to protect themselves. So there weren't three. Just, just saying. All right. Let's get into this. Matthew chapter 2. The Magi and the Great Escape. I hope to cover these. I think I have time. Yes, I should. Jesus was born in Bethlehem near, the Jerusalem, uh, near Jerusalem during the reign of King Herod. And here's something cool about Bethlehem. Bethlehem or Bethlehem means house of bread, the prophesied birthplace of the Messiah. However, the Hebrew word lehem can also mean fighters. Jesus was born in the house of fighters, not the Foo Fighters, the, these fighters. This is the city of David, one of the greatest fighters in the entire Bible. Perhaps this is why the people of Jesus' day expected him to fight the Romans and free their land from foreign occupation. Jesus fulfilled both aspects of the meaning of Bethlehem and Gethsemane and on the cross where he fought the Goliath on Golgotha <laughs> um, of our souls and won and became the bread for the world. This little town of Bethlehem, it's, it's more important than we realized. After Jesus' birth, a group of spiritual priests from the east came to Jerusalem, or Magi. And again, astrologers is another way to look at them. Astronomers, the word astrology is very different. It has a different meaning back then than it does today. Uh, it's more nuanced. It's more collective. Um, it's, not, it's not just stargazing and reading signs and thinking it's your, you have to guess what your future would be and you have your tarot cards and all that stuff. It was nothing like that. These were historians and scientists and they were philosophers and deep spiritual leaders and learners. These wealthy priests would have traveled with an entourage for protection as officials from the East. The Greek word magos is taken from the Mede language and means spiritual advisors or simply priests. They were appointed by Darius over the state religion as priests of Persia, which is modern day Iran and served as official advisor to the king. By the time of Jesus' birth, Persia had been conquered and was being governed by successors to Alexander the Great. It is possible these Magos came from the um, Mestopian region of Seleucia, wherever that is, see Daniel 2 and 5, where the prophet Daniel is given the title of chief of the Magio. It is probable that these magos were descendants of those who had been taught by Daniel and because of his prophecy of the Messiah being cut off they may have been able to decipher the date of his birth along with the interpretation of this star that was rising. Daniel was likely the primary teacher to those people 
and 400 years of being tutored. That's, these magi were waiting. They were studying. They knew the history. They knew exactly what the religious, religious leaders in um, Jerusalem knew. They saw it all. They read it all. And we're going to find out in just a moment that's true. But to think, oh, look, a star. Let's follow that. That's cool. Okay, let's do that. That's not what happened. Some people don't realize. They, they think, oh, that's, you know, there's a weird story of Magi. And it was like God doing a miracle. No, 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 no. There's, there's some history here. And it was on purpose. And they inquired of the people, where is this child who is born king of the Jewish people? We observed his star rising in the sky, and we've come to bow before him and worship. Now, where did they go for this? I thought they read the prophecies. I thought they would know something. And they missed the Bethlehem part, I think. But where does royalty hang out? In the main cities. You don't bring a prime minister or a dignitary to Elmira. You, you bring them to like at least Waterloo, Tech City, or Toronto, capital of Ontario, or maybe Ottawa, any of the major cities. That, that's where you bring royalty. That's where you bring distinguished guests. And just like when you have guests from out of country, you take them to Niagara Falls or wherever to, to see these big sites, okay? But they went to Jerusalem because they assumed the seat of power was there. Well, that didn't go well. King Herod was shaken to the core when he heard this. And not only him, but all of Jerusalem was disturbed when they heard this news. I wonder why. First of all, Herod was disturbed because he's an evil person. He's a bad boy. He had a reputation of taking out anybody that just barely threatened his throne. Like even if you had a, a jester in the court and there was a, he made a joke about taking over the throne, well, he got done. He got impaled, dead, beheaded. He's, you don't joke about that. I think he even took out his mother. Not kidding. He took out relatives. He, he killed anyone that was even vaguely a threat. If someone gave a rumor to Herod, even though it was not true, that's a great way to get your, somebody killed for you legally. Tell Herod he wants your throne. And that's the kind of guy Herod was. And the people knew it. So not only was Herod shaken, because, oh boy, king of the Jews, I'm the king. Well, now Jerusalem's getting all, oh shoot, what's this going to mean? I have a hunch. Don't know if that's, you know, who knows. But anyway. So he called a meeting of the Jewish ruling priests and religious scholars. This is interesting. Watch this next part demanding that they tell him where the promised Messiah was prophesied to be born. And without beating or uh, a single missing a beat, here we go. He'll be born in Bethlehem in the land of Judah, they told him. Oh, Bethlehem, that was easy. Of course, you could look that up. They knew. They knew, but they weren't. Waiting, just like that cartoon we showed at the very beginning. There's no room in the end because of the convention. <laughs> it's actually kind of funny because we do that too. We get ourselves so busy with activities, conventions, and courses and studies that we miss Jesus, the presence of Christ in us, with us all the time. Because the prophecy states, so if the answer wasn't enough, here's the prophecy where they got it from. And you, little Bethlehem, are not insignificant among the clans of Judah, for out of you will emerge the shepherd king of my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the spiritual priests from the east to ascertain the exact time the star first appeared. See, Herod was no dummy. He caught on. And he told them, now, go to Bethlehem and carefully look there for the child. And when you've found him, report to me so that I can go and bow down and worship him too. <laughs> this is a drama stage, remember? And so they left. And on their way to Bethlehem, suddenly the same star they had seen in the east reappeared. Now, that's interesting. How many of you caught that over the years? That it reappeared. That means it stopped working. It got unplugged or the battery died or something happened and they were unable to see it. 
But then when they headed the right direction, maybe, maybe the star disappeared from their sight when they went to Jerusalem because it was not the right place. Maybe as they went, and maybe they heard while Herod was asking, where's this, where's this uh, baby supposed to be born? Maybe the wise men were there and heard all that, and that's why they knew Bethlehem. Or the king told them, okay, go to Bethlehem. Why wouldn't the king go? Why wouldn't he send people right away? One, he can't affirm Jewish tradition. You can't, you know, he would be a fool to go there, nothing's there, and then, oh, that means he listened to the Hebrew people, making their theology more superior. He didn't want competition. So he sent someone else to be the embarrassment, but also to confirm. That's what he was doing. So it reappeared. Amazed, they watched as they, it went ahead of them and stopped directly over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were so ecstatic that they shouted and celebrated with unrestrained joy. Hmm, interesting. When they came into the house, what? Look at that. Oh my goodness, it's not a manger. Here's issue number two with the Christmas story. The wise men never showed up at the nativity scene. They showed up at a house. Almost every translation shows us that. And it was almost just around the two-year mark. Remember, Herod, you'll see later, every kid under two gets killed in that town. So there's like a, how long did it take for them to travel from when the star appeared? Did the star appear the moment Jesus was born? And then the wise men saw it and then gathered up and started traveling. It took a long, long time, likely. But here, they came to the house and saw the young child with Mary. Now, by the way, it's okay to have the magi, the wise men, in your manger scene. It's okay, because they're part of the story. They're just, you know, add on a little later. So you got to pull it together for the sake of niceness and a nice scene. So it's okay, just so you know. When they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they were overcome. Falling to the ground at his feet, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure boxes full of gifts and presented him with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These wise men were extremely wealthy. They presented gifts that totaled a great sum of money. Not tiny presents wrapped with bows, but treasure chests full of financial wealth. Although we are not given the monetary value of each type of gift, we know that frankincense and myrrh were extremely costly. These gifts would have financed Joseph and Mary and Jesus' exodus to Egypt and supplied their living expenses for a number of years even after returning to Israel. Gold is an often used symbol of the deity of Christ. Frankincense points to his perfect life of holiness, excellence, and devotion. And myrrh, an embalming spice, speaks to us of the suffering love that would lead him to the death on the cross. Great symbolism in the gifts. Afterwards, they returned to their own country by another route because God had warned them in a dream not to go back. Huh. Let's take a look at this video clip and how they may have had that conversation of not going back the same way. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Mm -hmm. We can't go back. Not this way. But this is the way that we came. I know. And it will take us directly to Herod. Just as he asked us to move. No, it won't do it. We've got to protect this child. Protect? From whom? We all observed Herod's reaction when we told him of our intentions to go visit this newborn Messiah. He told us to return to him to report what we saw. That's what we do. It is the way that he wanted information. Assuring us that he was going to worship this newborn king. Did you see his eyes? Did you see Herod's eyes? They were dead. He's not an old boy's one. His last church and course will have three months to the journey. Friends, please listen to me. Those who came before us were shown the scriptures by day, of course. And then we have 
studied these scriptures. We weighed them. We found and we found. But we discovered faith. We followed the destiny star for months. That takes faith. Yes, yes, that is faith. Yes. But consider this. We are kingmakers. We have inherited the power to give authority and rule for generations. Yes. I believe that today, today, we have found one who I believe we will bow to. <coughs> Child says, to whom kingmakers bow. This changes everything. This child threatens her, threatens all who worship her. Oh, no. We are not going to change our plans just because you have some uninformed rush out a vision. Go on. A dream. Last night. I thought it was just fatigue settling in. But now I know it was a warning to not return to her. You might have mentioned this. <laughs> Next scene that is in the series, they show up at the manger. <laughs> anyway, I thought it was funny. After they had gone, Joseph had another dream. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Get up now and flee to Egypt. Take Mary and the little child and stay there until I tell you to leave. For Herod intends to search for the child to kill him. So that very night... He got up and took Jesus and his mother and made their escape to Egypt. And he remained there until Herod died. All of this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through his prophet. I summon my son out of Egypt. This is the second weird location where the Messiah is supposed to be coming from. Mary and Joseph got forced through a census to go to Bethlehem because the prophecy said in Bethlehem it'll happen. Well, how does this Egypt thing work? Well, thanks to Herod, it happened. They got forced out and off they went to Egypt until Herod died. Hence the prophecy. It's pretty cool when you see all these connected dots coming together. When Herod realized that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. So he sent soldiers with orders to slaughter every baby boy, two years old and younger, in Bethlehem and throughout the surrounding countryside. Not just Bethlehem, the whole region. That's a lot of death, a lot of sorrow. Based on the time frame he was given from the interrogating from interrogating the wise men, this fulfilled the words of the prophet Jeremiah. I hear the screams of anguish, weeping and wailing in Ramah. By the way, prophecy, these things foretold, is not God saying, I'm going to make this all happen. Otherwise, God could be the cause of this horror, which I don't believe God is a cause of this death at all. I think that's the way evil works. Instead, having the prophecy is seeing in advance and knowing what is going to happen. That's different than causing it to happen a certain way and then telling everybody how it's going to work. It's food for thought if you've not thought of it like that before. But I think there's more to prophecy than we've been told. I think it's much deeper and wider. I think there's a better way to understand Prophecy, because prophecy also means to unveil and find understanding, even in a text. It's pretty cool. I think, I think that's it. Oh yeah, oops, back to this. I hear screams of anguish, weeping and wailing in Rama. Rachel's weeping uncontrollably for her children, and she refuses to be comforted because they are dead and gone. Four candles. 
Advent. And the fifth one is Christmas, which is according to our calendar tomorrow. Another fun little tidbit. It's most likely that Jesus was not born on December 25th. I'm sure you guys have figured that out by now. But it's most likely sometime in March. End of March, beginning of April. That's, that's kind of, for those doing some history and research, I think that's a, a more natural time uh, according to the calendar. So uh, again, that's open for understanding and debate. But definitely not the 25th of December, just, just in case you wondered. <laughs> Let's close. Heavenly Father, thank you for this season of remembering. Thank you for inviting us into the story of how Jesus was born and all the prophecies that brought, brought us to this exciting time. And we get to benefit. We get to reap the benefits of this whole journey and receive and believe and experience your life in us. May we experience peace. And may we be peace to those around us over these, this holiday season. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Oh, next Sunday, we're online. So no setup, no teardown, no coffee. <laughs> That's okay. I'll be here. I, I can have coffee. But uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you for watching online. And uh, I'll send an email out again this week with that after church Zoom link again. Um, but I would love to see you all next time. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for being here in person today. Have a great week.